A hobby of mine and several other people is imagining a fictional country, creating a whole new world has had to the success of several books, movies, and games. On the one hand, you can create a place that is entirely distant from our own. On the other hand, you can create a country that is more rooted in reality, making your country bigger, combining different regions from different countries, or coping. You know, it's just a fun, creative exercise. And the best part about it is that you get to choose the identity of the fictional nation. Countries are able to identify themselves by having a specific name, flag, anthem, or language. But what this video is about is the border. The border of a country might exist because of a natural barrier, like rivers or mountains. Other times, the border is drawn on a line where people speak different languages or follow different religions. Borders are to countries like what eyes are to humans. They have them. But when I look at the borders of African countries, I get the feeling that the humans who made them actually did not have eyes. Unlike most places on Earth, we really didn't let Africa run its own course. Instead, we do the borders on a map, similar to how we create fictional countries, which is why we're now in the worst timeline. Yeah, this is what happens when OCs become canon. We've got many straight lines, strange panels, and a few enclaves and exclaves, all making as much sense as the American electoral college system. These weird borders cut through several ethnic groups, languages, and religions, and are just horrible. So in this video, we'll be discussing how this happened, and what an actually accurate appearance of Africa might look like. Let's get into it. Let's just get the obvious one out of the way first. European colonization and interest in Africa is what made these borders. Their reasons for entering Africa are what I like to call the three T's. Territory, trade, and trinkets. Okay, look, there are many synonyms for resources that start with the letter T, just go with it. The three T's, which the European powers wanted, was manifested through the borders. Britain wanted to connect Cape Town to Cairo, so the territories in between were given straight borders, because they couldn't care less. Belgium needed access to the ocean from the Congo to do trade, which is why the country has a panhandle. The other panel is sometimes called the Congo Pedicle, and was drawn because there's copper there, which is a trinket. And Germany wanted to have everything in the middle, but letting them own the Congo with all of its trinkets was too dangerous, so they only got the coastal areas. The squiggly borders were set in place because of European interests, while the straight borders were set in place because the region just didn't matter. But after World War II, nobody liked empires anymore, so they all transformed into nation-states. While an empire rules over several separate societies, a nation-state only contains one dominant ethnicity. The problem here is that this European idea was brought over to Africa, even though their border was still designed to fit European interests, and doesn't contain just one dominant ethnic group. The nation-state formula doesn't work here because all these countries are multi-ethnic. Except for Somalia, which, even though the country is 85% Somali, is the most fragile state besides the one who's literally been in a civil war with a billion different sides in 2014. Cold War moment! Just like Eurasia, Africa has also had a lot of empires, some examples being Mali, Khan and Bornu, and the several Egyptian dynasties. Unlike Eurasia though, Africa has always looked noticeably empty compared to the vibrant colors in the north and the east. To understand why, we need to understand Africa's geography. Africa is pretty long, so it's able to cross the equator, the Tropic of Cancer, and the Tropic of Capricorn. The equator is quite hot, as it is close to the sun, which is why there are rainforests there. The hot air from the equator is brought to the tropics, where deserts appear. Most notable here is the Sahara. It's very difficult to live in these areas, so empires that were there needed alternative allurements, like the Congo Empire following the Congo River, and Egypt following the Nile River. So hey, if you do live in the Sahara and are watching this video, you should probably subscribe. North Africa was often conquered by Arabian Caliphates, while East Africa was able to trade with them by sea, and West Africa used caravan routes and camels to cross the Sahara and trade with them as well. As a result, these areas are mostly converted to Islam, and many of the aforementioned empires also popped up here. On the other hand, Sub-Saharan Africa was mostly excluded from trading, which resulted in a deficiency of development. Because of this, the region had largely had tribal states, who had fierce warrior cultures and resisted European occupation, one of the more famous examples being the Zulu Kingdom. These lands would eventually convert to Christianity because of the Europeans, but they mostly kept speaking their Bantu and niger congo languages. Besides South Africa, which has kept speaking Afrikaans and also has 10 other official languages, oh my god! Now that we know the history and geography, let's talk about a few problems we need to overcome. The first problem is Africa's sheer diversity. There are over 3,000 different ethnicities and 2,000 different languages spoken on the continent. Can we give a country to all of them? No, the UN would get flooded with applicants in that case. Luckily, we can use the language families to lump some of them together. Just like English is closely related to Danish, who are both related to French, who are all distantly related to Persian. They're all Indo-European languages. 
While the lingual diversity in Africa is huge, they can generally divide into seven groups. Afro-Asiatic, mostly Arabic or Berber spoken in the north. Naro-Saharan, take three guesses where these ones are spoken. Niger-Congo, the most diverse one on the planet, so researchers often separate the Bantu languages from it. Khoisan, which isn't actually a thing, but they're put together for convenience. And the European, which is just Afrikaans in South Africa. And lastly, Austronesian, spoken on Madagascar. Now, information about some of these families is scarce, even Wikipedia admits it, so a couple inaccuracies will likely occur. Some languages considered to be part of Khoisan or Nilo Zahara are actually language isolates, meaning that they are their own family. Hey, to all of you language fans, want a fun thing to study? Please help me make sense of this mess, because I really need to cut corners here. Let's discuss the other problems with rapid fire. No just Sahara or just rainforest countries. You know, the Dwarks want to gain independence from Mali, but considering the fact that all the land is desert, I don't have much hope for them. Let's just say there's a reason why nobody has placed their capital in there. No double landlocked countries. A landlocked country is one that does not border the ocean, and a double landlocked country is one that only borders landlocked countries. The only two of these are Liechtenstein and Uzbekistan, who, let's say, have particular procedures to deal with it. But for the most part, this is a huge strategical and economic disadvantage. No mixed religions. Look, I'm all for inclusivity, but some of you just cannot behave. So I'll only put Christian and Islamic lands together if it would be actively detrimental for these lands if they weren't together. Now that that's out of the way, let's get to drawing, shall we? Believe it or not, this isn't the first time I've attempted this. Last year, I made a map of Africa taking into account the various religions, languages, and ethnicities. But when I was making the script, I noticed a couple obvious flaws. Some borders don't make sense, some names don't make sense, some countries that will become failed states, and dear god why did I not call them all in. So instead of working on the script, which is what I should have been doing, I instead decided to redraw the entire thing from scratch. That's just what the mental disorder does to you sometimes. So let's not wait any longer and reveal Accurate Africa V2. While you're taking the map, let me just say that I am not an expert in African geopolitics and I'm sure there are many people who can do a better job than me. This is just for fun, so I'd love to see any suggestions in the comments on how I could improve the map. So here's the explanation. This map contains a total of 57 countries, compared to the current 54. There are 52 on the mainland, and the 5 island nations of Madagascar, Cabo Verde, Sao Tome and Principe, Comoros and the Seychelles stay the same. Some countries have a dotted line going through them. This is because I originally had an independent country there, but since they could not survive because either they were surrounded by deserts, as rainforests, or double landlocked, I merged them with a similar enough neighbor, and made the original country an autonomous area, which there is also a list of. You could say that they are countries who did not quite make the cut. The first hard line we could draw is that of religion. The only exception is this Christian nation here, which I incorporated into the Islamic Vraya look because I had no other choice. Using religion, we can immediately make out some countries with traditional folk religions, Niamey, Togo, Ajok, Mutapa, and Madagascar. These also spread some Christian lands off of the main cluster, so they form Liberu, Ashantia, and Ethiopia. The next time we can draw is that of language families. From this we can make out Cape, Namibia, and Kogoland, followed by Adamawa making Ubangia and Nigeria, then Manding separating Songhai, Senegal, Guinea, Volta, and Fulania. A border between Nidoluka and Frailuk forced the creation of Kenya, Kush, Aksum, Sudan, Red Sahara, and finally Chausa. While Namibia and Red Sahara appear to be located in areas of different language families, it's fine because this is the desert and nobody lives here, besides the areas that actually are part of the same language family. At this point we're left with the large Afro-Asiatic and Bantu families, which we're going to have to split up a little more. Afro-Asiatic can be split between Arabic Berbers and Cushitics. From the first group we can distinguish the five North African countries we know and tolerate, and we'll let the Tuareg Berbers unite with the Hassania Arabics because of Rule 1, creating Atlantic Sahara. The other group we can split up between Oromo Adal, Afar Djibouti, and Somali Somalia. Now, let's fill out the Bantus. The Bantu plus Islamic area can be split between Tiswahili and Rivuma. Angola has African languages, but most of it still speaks Portuguese. We can follow some language family branches to make out the Nagunis of Nagunizwe, the Tswanas of Botswana, the Twa and Ronga of Tswaronga, and the Bambas of Zimbabwe, which also contains a little Naguni area that is too far away from Nagunizwe for me to care. 
Now we're left with what I thought was the most difficult area to map out, and I think the doll lines show that. Congo, Malawi, and Makua mostly follow a specific branch of the Bantu languages. Tanzania was merged with Rwanda, Burundi, and Uganda because of Rule 2, creating Tanganyika. They speak French or Fang in Fangabon, and Lingala is a common lingua franca in Lingalia. And the French off, Zambia, Chokruzi, and Katanga are common nations of the ones who remained. And that's how we got here. Of course, chasing Africa like this today isn't a very good option, but it's always fun to speculate. And honestly, if you have any ideas for these countries involving their names, SV, flags, capital, border changes, alliances, or anything else, please let me know so we can both geek out over it. Hey hey, thank you for sticking around till the end. I'll continue with my schedule by uploading a video about landlocked navies next week, which will be in a similar style as this one. So if you like this video and want to see the next one, you can subscribe and ring the bell, all of that YouTube stuff. Alright, see ya.